if I was going to have my partner in crime here, the one and only Nick Luck. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Cheers to you, Nick. It's nice to see you. I mean, talk about a, a late arrival, putting me on pins and needles, whether or not I was going to have you here. No sound? Do you not have sound? Okay. He has no sound. So we're going to continue. Welcome everybody to week 17 of Cocktails and Conversation. Thanks to the Breeders Cup for giving us this fun Thursday afternoon show, evening show, and we've got some delicious cocktails that the one and only mixologist Mark Teberty will be putting forth for us and some really exciting guests that I'm looking forward to. I don't know if we're good luck here on Cocktails and Conversations, but if you were with us last week, we interviewed trainer Jack Sisterson, who had Vexatious in the win and your in personal ensign for the Breeders' Cup Distaff. Well, what did she do? She won and she is in. That was his very first grade one victory. So we're going to try and do that again for trainer Simon Callahan, who's running in the grade one ballerina at Saratoga. No, I still can't hear you. I mean, some people might enjoy having us on mute, but not this show. <laughs> so I'm going to keep going. Trainer Simon Callahan has Bellafina in the ballerina. That's a win and you're in for the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint. And we're also going to catch up with jockey Javier Castellano, who I heard rounded out the afternoon at Saratoga in a winning way, 10 to 1. When do you get 10 to 1 on Javier Castellano? So we'll talk to him about the Travers, uh, seven time leading or six time. He's going for seven, I should say, in the Travers Stakes coming up this weekend at Saratoga. So cheers to those of you out there watching and no better time to bring in Mark Tuberty. Mark, how have you been? Fill us in on uh, the last week since we saw you. You know, it's been a good week. I guess not too many changes around here. We had a uh, tropical storm, I think Isaias with a proper pronunciation. So we got some heavy rainfall. I know my parents lost power in Connecticut. Uh, so that's been the biggest news around here. So just staying inside and weathering the storm. But other than that, I've been watching some great racing. That was an incredible personal event on uh, Saturday. What a race, what a finish. Yeah, it was. Um, and I'm excited to make some fun cocktails this week. I think maybe without the commentary from Nick Luck, we might be on track for a pretty awesome show. So You know what we might, we might keep things actually <laughs> in line here today. Right. Tonight. Uh, <laughs> what are we mixing up for everybody today? Well, we're gonna be doing a summary take on one of my favorite cocktails, the Irish coffee. We're gonna be going back in time a little bit to talk about how that drink came about, some fun stories. And we're gonna be making a riff on the breakfast martini. So you might be noticing we have sort of a breakfast theme going on here, um, created by an amazing, amazing, legendary figure in the bartending community. So lots of fun history, great drinks to have here at five o'clock or I don't know, Saturday at 12 or one o'clock during brunch. So we'll figure it, it out. Works. It works. We don't judge. Let's say hello to some of you watching out there. Renee Ross says, Brittany's giraffes. I moved from the giraffes, but I still have a jungly background. Uh, Trisha Hill, always looking forward to Thursday's cocktails and conversation. Mitchell saying, hello, Bill, how are you? Randy Carter, hi, from St. Louis to my favorite show host and one of my favorite jockeys, Javier Castellano. We will catch up with him in just a bit. Dorian Dickinson, always so supportive of this show, celebrating week 17 of cocktails and conversation. How about this? 14 years since my first date with Sarah Dickinson and the kickoff of my birthday weekend. I love that. Oh, Cheers man. to you, Jordan yes. Sarah. That's amazing. This, the Dickinsons are so supportive of this show. I got to admit, half the time, they've got the ingredients prepped for this show before I do. So that's how on top of it they are. <laughs> <laughs> but I love them. Love all of our viewers. That, yeah. You, you had some unique ingredients today. Um, I didn't recognize most of them, but I think you made it easy for some viewers. Raw sugar, is that one of the ingredients we need today? Sugar yeah, in the raw? So, yeah, we're going to, I mean, we can get into that a little bit as far as the different types of sugar, whether it's uh, refined sort of white sugar, that's your common house sugar, um, brown sugar, which is basically that refined sugar that's had some molasses added to it, which has that kind of cakey consistency. Or in this case, we're going to use the sugar in the raw or demerara sugar which long story short is basically partially reduced sugarcane juice that's been put into a centrifuge. So you have large crystals, uh, but yeah, it adds a lot of depth to cocktails. You get some great rich molasses notes and that definitely works for the, uh, the Irish coffee, or in this case, the Kentucky cold drink. 
Delicious. Jennifer Pinkerton Cook wishing Sarah a happy birthday. Happy Thursday from Mary. Um, GR Susie, I'm going to call you great Susie, says Met Javi in Saratoga, such a gracious person and Hall of Fame jockey. I actually, Mark, put out on Instagram earlier if people had any questions. So I'll get to this a little bit later, but we did have a question specifically for you about ice cubes. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's I'm so much. I'm going you strange questions. Oh, well, you know, I mentioned in the past, the cool thing about ice is that the larger it is, the slower it melts. So it's all about surface area. So mm -hmm. if you've ever thought about what did they do before we came up with the modern day refrigeration, so our, our household refrigeration and freezers, which are so convenient for us now, but what did they do before that? How were they introducing ice to cocktails? What did they the do? They could, the way they could do that was actually take in ice from frozen lakes, large, large chunks, massive chunks of ice from frozen lakes. If and they were able to, frozen. Yeah, and they, and they were able to transport that ice to vendors, whether it's restaurants or other businesses, because of the fact that it was so large. So that's how they could literally put these massive chunks of ice into, well, wagons or whatever it was, and then transport it, and then they would break it down from there. So if you ever go to a craft cocktail bar and you see them with a giant block of ice behind right. the bar and they're carving it down, that's sort of a throwback to this idea of how bars used to acquire ice. Um, it's a fascinating subject. That we is. could really, we could do a whole whole episode on the topic of ice. So whoever asked that question, Maybe thank we you. Because I'm, I, I'm geeky about it. I love it. We will dedicate an entire show just to ice and Sierra. But I think we are ready to bring back in Nick Luck. We we put him in the corner for just a bit. Uh, yeah. Nick, can we hear you? Uh, I hope so. Can you hear me? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, I just Nick? missed Mark. Hi, hi, Britt. Um, Sorry, sorry, I'm late. I, I was rushing back from Stratford races, Stratford as in Shakespeare country, where I was uh, overseeing a nine race jumps card. And I, I did get in in time, but I had some IT issues. So apologies for that. I spoke with you two hours ago. You were driving that entire time? Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. But that's good. That's good. Can <laughs> I, uh... Welcome. You've got your you got your Chardonnay or what are we drinking tonight? Yeah, our producer's being very demanding this evening. So obviously I've had some IT issues. So I've had to switch computers, etc. So the lighting's a little dim, the backdrop's rubbish. But listen, you all know me well enough by now. It's fine. I feel like we're friends. You'll just forgive this this week. Mark, I just missed that last bit about the ice. Can you just run me through that again? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you want me to. But yeah, that, well, I'm going to try to make a long story short because I don't know if our customers, our viewers want to hear the whole thing. I think he's being facetious. Uh, <laughs> I'm not. Oh, come on. <laughs> well, there's more to talk about with ice. Tell you what, we'll, we'll get to it as we go, Nick. Okay. But it's great to see you. <laughs> I do think it is time. Why not? Because I know he's ready. He's got his glass of wine uh, to bring in our first guest of the evening. That is Definitely. trainer Simon Callahan, but from your land across the pond, Nick Luck, if he is with us. There he is. Simon, his hello. IT is better. Hey, Simon, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Good evening. Good Good afternoon, Brittany. We'll Simon start. doesn't uh, have any IT issues, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're trying to do this week, Simon, is to bestow upon you the same cocktails and conversation good fortune. Brittany may have already done all this, as <laughs> we did to Jack Sisterson last week before he, he trained his first grade one winner and went very close to having two grade one winners in the same afternoon on the other side of the country. Uh, what an extraordinary day. And as he's a good old pal of yours and you're missing him in California, I'm sure you want to pass on your CNC congratulations. Yeah, no, absolutely. That was fantastic uh, to see Jack have such a good day. And it was definitely Brittany's uh, selling point to getting me on the show that it was such good luck for Jack and I should absolutely do it. So, no, that was fantastic to see for Jack. And, uh, yeah, hopefully it can happen for me as well. Yeah, Nick, he was a little reluctant to come on the show, I'll be honest. Slightly pulling I teeth with Simon. I find this hard to believe. Like I, I know you're a, you know, you, you don't like to push yourself forward. A little bit publicity shy, but I thought an hour in the company of me and Brittany with a drink in your hand, something you've never done before, it would be an interesting first. It would be an interesting first for you. I yeah, totally exactly. wasn't an hour. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, no pleasure to join you guys, and especially with a glass of wine, that's uh, going to make it all the better. Well, share with us, uh, what is the drink of choice? I know you you showed us earlier you're a go-to with wine, but what's the uh, varietal? It's uh, Chateau Neuf de Pape, a French uh, red wine. Mm. Um, nothing too fancy, just a simple, uh, you know, easy drinking wine. So one of my favorites, actually. Delish. Well, hey, cheers to that. 
Cheers. Uh, and how have you been, Kelly, the last few weeks, months? How have you been finding it all? Yeah, no, all's been pretty good. Um, you know, it was obviously a sort of a turbulent time through all the COVID when we weren't racing. Um, and that was kind of frustrating for, for everyone, including all the owners. Um, but hopefully we're getting uh, broke the back of that now. And, um, you know, nice to be down here at Del Mar and, um, you know, looking forward to having a good summer. Take us back, though, because you, you've spent, I believe, is it 11 years now in Southern California since you've come over? Yeah, I think it's 11 years now. So, yeah, no, it's been been quite a while. That's wild. But your father, a very well-known trainer before he retired over in England. Um, for you, at what point in time when you were younger did you know you wanted to become a trainer? Was that something because dad did it, you knew you were going to follow in line with him? Yeah, it was something that I was always extremely passionate about uh, from a very young age. And, um, you know, both my parents pretty much accepted that I'd forego school. And, you know, I, I was just obsessed with horse racing. And um, I think, um, you know, they were very supportive of it. You know, they knew that I was, um, you know, very ambitious and, and very sort of track minded to, to be a, um, a racehorse trainer. So, um, Thankfully, um, you know, it was, um, you know, good, good uh, understanding parents that were all for it. Simon, what a, a lot of uh, American viewers may be not familiar with is your is your riding career, which was, <laughs> uh, well, no, don't laugh. It was, it was brief, but it was, it was quite successful in its own way. Um, look at you. Yeah. Look at you. Is that really you? <laughs> yeah, a little bit lighter back then, Nick, but... Um... <laughs> quite handsome as well yeah i know a lot's gone wrong since but um yeah no it was something that a lot of us um did uh, back then they were amateur races so um you know i remember charlie hills ollie cole there was quite a few trainers sons did it and honestly it was just pretty much for for fun uh had very senior horses that um pretty much could um put the saddle on themselves and steer themselves and uh no, had a couple of winners, and um, yeah, it was it, it, it was fun, and definitely gives you an appreciation for um, you know how fit jockeys really are and what they go through on a day to day basis. Um, it was uh, yeah, the, the fitness was definitely when you kind of had a ride once every two or three months. You you, you it is pretty tough. <laughs> I can imagine. So the the riding career was short lived, and training. Did you assist your dad for a while before um, going out on your own? Yeah, so I assisted uh, dad for a while, um, and then when I was twenty one, I had a couple of sort of um, months at Todd Pletcher's during a few uh, winters, and one in New York. Um, also worked for Richard Hannon, and then went back to my dad. And no, had a you know all those sort of three people gave me a pretty good broad spectrum view on, on, on everything. And, um, you know, yeah, I found myself back with dad and trained for two years in England before moving out here. I mean, Nick, this is something that we asked Jack, the, mm. what brought him over to America? What was the fascination? I mean, was there a fascination for you, Simon, with the States? Yeah, I mean, you know, Breeders' Cups at Santa Anita was always something that really intrigued me. Um, and, you know, we'd seen how well a lot of uh, Phillies, particularly from Europe, came and did so well at Santa Anita. You know, you could get, you know, maybe a listed class filly that could come out to California and um, enhance her record and become, you know, a graded state winner. So that was initially my angle, um, you know, when I moved out, was trying to get some good fillies that we could, um, you know, enhance their profile and get some more black type and some graded state races. And, um it was actually a grown up by Anthony Ramsden that initially supported me with some horses and, um, you know, spoke to a few other clients and, um, you know, it felt like the right time for me to do it, you know, still pretty young at the time. So, um, yeah, no, looking forward to it. And um, Ollie Bell says hi. Evening, Ollie. <laughs> he says love Cali. We all love Cali. Don't uh, Cali, <laughs> I, I, wanted, I wanted to ask you. You, you got your trainer's license in, in the UK when you were very young, still in your very early 20s. Yeah. And you, you always seem outwardly like quite quite chilled and, and maybe you take things in your stride. Do you, just, do you think you had the temperament that was well suited to it from a pretty early age? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I think, you know, that was something my dad didn't have was a great temperament. So, you know, he kind of 
you know, let things sort of bother him. And, you know, he was pretty fiery. So, you know, I kind of watched him and I thought, you know, that was probably one of his weaknesses, you know, that you with this game, it can be very up and down and frustrating. So I think you've just got to try and at least have the persona that you've got a good temperament, but it's just that way. <laughs> so, so I was just going to say, you learned that from him not to do. What did you learn from him that you kind of still use today? That do you, Can you hear um, that? I swear, it's okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think one thing, you know, that my dad was very anal on was, um, you know, his attention to detail. He wanted mm -hmm. to always feed the horses the best feed you can have given them the best bedding, you know, just not cut corners, do everything yeah. to the highest standard. He took a lot of pride in um, his horse's appearance, you know, what condition they had, how they looked, how they were turned out. So I think that was, you know, one of the things that was ingrained in me pretty young is just to, you know, do absolutely everything to the highest standard, you know, for your horse and, you know, they'll, uh, they'll pay you back. Mm -hmm. Can you ever, can you think of a, of a time when you were, maybe in your teens or or even younger when you you saw a horse win or you were involved in a in a win and you thought i want a piece of this now this is this is what i want to do i'm i'm going to be immersed in this for the rest of my life uh, honestly it was pretty early on i mean not one defining moment or horse um specifically just the game it just really intrigued me you know the you know trying to get top class horses um you know, and to try and do it at the, you know, at the at the very top, you know, just, you know, I wanted to, you know, growing up watching Breeders' Cups, you know, watching the likes of Giants Causeway. And so, you know, I just wanted to, to be part of it. And, um, you know, it was just the whole game from every kind of different facet just just drew me in. And, um, you know, I'm still, you know, as passionate now as, you know, I ever, ever have been. I love hearing that because anybody that knows what goes into training a horse, it is 24 seven, 365 days a year. You live, breathe it, you sleep it. So for you to say that you still have as much passion now as you did back then, just goes to show your passion for the sport and these horses. Um, how do you continually take steps forward in a game that can knock you down sometimes. I mean, Nick and I were talking about all your accolades earlier and you have had some incredible horses, but you've been so close to breathing that rarefied air in the Breeders' Cup races, in the Kentucky Derby. Mm. What keeps you going and moving forward um, despite getting so close to those moments? You know, you just have to keep moving forward. Like you said, you know, every day is a new day. You know, there's certainly some, some tough days, um, you know, nights when you get back and it was, you know, had a hard luck story and, you know, like after the Breeders' Cup, I mean, both of our fillies really fired big races, Donna Bellucci and Bellafina, and yet, you know, we came up short, but, you know, that's something that I just, you just got to be persistent. You've got to keep showing up every year, you know, and getting to those races, you've got to take a bit of, um, um, you've got to be thankful that, you, you know, we've got some great clients that support us. Um, I've got a great team around me. Um, you know, my assistant, Carlos, um, he's fantastic. You know, Ben McElroy that helps me out. You know, it's, you know, they're giving us the opportunity every year to get to these big races. And, you know, you just want to, um, for your clients that have supported you, you just want to pull it off for them. And you've just got to keep moving forward and, and keep trying. You've got to celebrate so, the moment though, right? That, 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 that again? As much. you got to celebrate the moment and, and each time you get to these either big stage or celebrate the victory do you allow yourself yeah look i think you've got to because you know when you've had a great day um in this game you know there's going to be you know whether it's the next day or two days there's going to be something that knocks you straight down to you know to earth and and so you've got to enjoy the good days you know it's it's there's lots of ups and downs and tough days, but you've got to um, you've got to enjoy the good days because unfortunately there's never enough of them. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about that that Kentucky Derby because I know you came off second, but do you ever look back on that and think that was a, a pretty extraordinary experience in the round? And on reflection, given the horse that I finished second to at the time, could you could you really appreciate what it was? Yeah, no, that, that's right. I mean, at, at the time, it was, you know, a, a lot of emotions. You're extremely proud that the horse ran such a big race. Um, and then, like you said, you look back and you and you sort of take it all in and you, you know, he's arguably one of the, you know, the, the best 
horses of recent generation, American Pharaoh. And, you know, Firing Line really ran, you know, his A race that day. You know, he he walked over to the paddock. He looked awesome. You know, he did everything right. You know, he got a perfect trip, a perfect ride, and he ran his heart out. And he just got run down by, a, you know, the horse on the day that was superior. So, yeah, you can take um, some disappointment that you didn't quite do it, but you've got to be, you know, proud in, in, in you know, the way the horse ran and, you um, you know, hopefully we can, um, you know, keep getting back to that big stage. I thought Robert, and we put it in here, asked a great question. He said, does failure make you hungrier? And I wouldn't call that <laughs> failure by any means. That that was an incredible race. But in this game, does it? I think for sure, because, um, you know, we, we've been lucky enough to win quite a few grade one races. But, you know, Breeders' Cups, Oaks, Derby, you know, they, they've alluded to this. But, you know, we're definitely going to keep um, you know moving forward and um, just keep pursuing the dream and um, hopefully one day we can um, pull off some of those um, you know types of races I'm sure it's sooner rather than later <laughs> Simon you you train for some unbelievable clients you know people of serious profile and, and people who expect success as well and you know sometimes people with with pretty big egos to to go with it are you are you good at managing people like are you good at managing these high profile clients uh you know i don't i don't know really um yeah. you know but you know definitely you know when you're getting the you know, more expensive sort of yearling purchases expensive breeze up purchases you know there's definitely some some pressure that you put upon yourself because a lot of the time you know i've been involved uh, a little bit with the buying process so you know, there's definitely a massive want from me for that horse to turn out and be a great horse, you know, as there is the owner. And, you know, I think all you can do is just do your best um, and uh, do the best by the horse and, um, you know, just be sort of open and honest with your with your owners at any time. And um, like I said, you, you can only do your best. And, um, you know, that's that's what we always do. When you, you reflect on your career thus far and the success that you've had, is there one moment that feels most rewarding, perhaps because of uh, your involvement, not only training, but buying or um, a hard luck story that turns out a certain way? Is there any like one moment in time that you look back on and be like, that was a, a very proud moment, something that was very fulfilling? Um, you know, I think, you know, firing line, the way he ran in the derby was definitely one of those points. But there's nothing specific. I mean, there's definitely been a lot of, um, you know, good good times when you look back and you're just very grateful for the horse and, and everyone that's kind of helped you get there. You know, it's such a team effort, um, you know, with, with everyone at the barn. You, you know, you're just invested in it with the clients, you know, with everyone that's kind of helped you. So um, I don't know. There's nothing specific. I mean, it was certainly very fun to win the test with American Gal. Mm -hmm. which is a filly that Kaleem um, bred top and bottom. I mean, that was pretty special because I know that meant a lot to him. I mean, he he um, he owned the, the sire and the mare and, um, you know, bred a test winner, which is pretty remarkable. So, you know, look, I'm just, it's nice to pull off the big days for, for the people that have supported you. Mm -hmm. No doubt. That was a special, I remember, I was standing next to your assistant Carlos that day and he was almost in, in tears when she won the test stakes. Um, and I think Carlos is worth mentioning again. I mean, uh, Carlos is a, is a man. Um, I think a lot of people should know about because of what he's been through, but his dedication to the animal. Um, how did you get connected with Carlos and what has he, he meant to your barn? You know, Carlos is, is undoubtedly a huge part of the barn. He brings, you know, a lot of passion, you know, every day he's, He's got a exceptional dedication, you know, to the horse. You know, he he is happy being in the barn, you know, twenty hours a day. I mean, that's what he loves. He's, you know, it means so much to him. So it, it's nice to, you know, to to be able to bring good horses to the barn and and let everyone, you know, collectively, you know, hopefully do a really good job. So, no, Carlos is a huge part, and um, you know, it's uh, much appreciated. And for those that don't know, Carlos uh, had kidney failure and went through months of dialysis and just couldn't wait to get back to the barn. So that was I was that's what I was alluding to. Um, and I say everything that he's been through. So an important part of that team. Um, but Nick, we've got an important runner this weekend for Simon. Oh, we have, and I, 
I, the Bella Fina, she she seems to have been around quite a while now. But uh, you know, maybe it may be Simon that her best days are, are still in front of her. Do you still think that that this filly's got more to offer? I do. I mean, she's got you know still got an extraordinary appetite for racing. Um, you know, every morning she, she she just loves her job. I mean, you know, she's won a Grade One at two and three, and um, it would be fantastic that we could mm. uh, pull it off at four. Like you said, it seems like she's been around f- forever, but you know because she's achieved so much, but, you know, she's still a four-year-old and mm-hmm. hopefully still got a lot of blue sky in regards to her racing career. She ran a bang-up race in the Breeders' Cup last year behind Kofefe. Yeah. Worth revisiting. On the inside of Heaven Has My Nikki, Kofefe and Spice Perfection, three and four wide respectively on the turn. Now the four of them bunch up. Bella Fina sits right behind them in fifth. Come dancing's got to come going now. She's about seven lengths behind. Went 44.78 for a half. And they're into the stretch. And Kofefi has made a run. She has taken over here. And from off the pace now, she's two and a half lengths in front. Bella Fina on the outside tries to run her down. Spice Perfection is third. 16th to go. Kofefi, Bella Fina on the far outside. These two coming down to the line. And Kofefi does it. Oh, it, it's painful, but yet she ran so well against, you know, a fully, God, I wish Kefefi was still running. I bet you probably yeah, don't, no. but I, I, I do in some ways. <laughs> yeah, she's a, you know, a really, really good, good, talented filly. Obviously, she broke the track record at Pimlico. I mean, you know, it, you know, we're definitely running against the, you know, the very best. And, um, you know, I think that was two huge efforts from, from both fillies. I mean, <laughs> You know, I, I trained a couple of horses for um, uh, Jamie Roth and Ellen J. Foxwoods, and they're, you know, fantastic people for the game. Um, and, um, you know, they thoroughly deserved it. And, um, you know, their mare came out on top. Um, but no, we're certainly very proud of the way Bellafina ran that day. That was certainly one of her best races to date. Well, she's shipping to Saratoga for the ballerina. And I know you get this question all the time, but what is it about Bellafina when you trap when she travels that for whatever reason doesn't put forth her best effort? You know, it, it's kind of interesting because, you know, I think every time, you know, she's ran um, away from California, you know, they've been in a races that are potentially a little bit too far for her. Um, you know, when she ran in the Oaks and she ran in the Breeders' Cup. So I think it's slightly harsh from that standpoint. Um, and then the one time we ran in the test, um, she didn't have the blinkers that day. I think that was kind of through fault of mine. Um, so I think, you know, I really, and I've said this before, but I really do think, you know, everything's sort of aligned um, for her to run, you know, her best race outside of California. I think she's doing really well. Um, you know, it's a it's a good field as you would expect, but I love her post position, and I you know think the race should set up well for us. So um, you know, it would be really gratifying if she could pull off a, a Grade One on her travels. Um, you know, we know how good she is in California, and hopefully she can prove that she can do it equally yeah. um, outside of California. F- funnily enough, when she went to Pennsylvania last year and ran in the in the Cotillion, I didn't think there was anything about the way she ran in that race that suggested that she wasn't enjoying herself or fine away from home she tanked and she traveled through the race you just felt it was just a bridge too far in in terms of getting that distance you know you knew you knew when she would would cut back and she'd have a a bit of a pace to run at 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 seven she'd be a completely different proposition yeah that's right i mean obviously she's she has won a grade one going going long she's a santa anita oaks winner Mm. but you know when you look back that probably wasn't the strongest grade one um, and I think seven eights is a perfect distance, you know, lots of speed in front of her to run at. And, um, you know, the, if the race unfolds that way, um, you know, I'm sure she's going to run her, going to run her, you know, a race. And she finally got off the rail. I feel like that poor girl has drawn the rail uh, more often than not. Um, this is something that I personally love to hear. And I think some of the viewers do too. What is she like just as a horse, what is her demeanor like? What is she like at the barn? We know what a talent she is on the racetrack, um, but for you, what, what is she? What is she like personality-wise? She's actually she's a great um, sort of personality. She's just one of those types of fillies that doesn't really want fussing. You know, she just loves to go out there and train. You know, she's um, she's not one that you'll just sort of pet in the barn endlessly, and she kind of enjoy it. She's kind of, you know, she's got a pretty tough streak to her. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know it's um you know she's just a cool filly to be around because every day you go out and watch her she just 
every time she works really good she you know just can tell she just loves what she does and um like i said hopefully she can continue for through this year and uh, possibly uh, as a five-year-old uh, this is a bit of a question for for both of you really because i know i'm never I know how pa <laughs> <laughs> well i know how passionate you both are about racing in california and you know a lot of people are, are migrating away and they don't see much of a future for it but simon you know as a as an expat who, who's moved there, you, you probably have more passion for, for the place and for training there than, than a lot of people I, I, I've met. Did, is that sustained through this, this difficult year? Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, it's, um, you know, I love, you know, living in California, you know, I love being based at Santa Anita, you know, it's so nice having just one move a year coming down to Del Mar, which is, you know, it's, it's a pleasure. And I think, you know, we've shown that California is a fantastic place to train out of you know we've got great weather um, you don't get that kind of humidity or rain that you get back east and um you know when horses travel from california the top horses you know they're proven every year to be um as good a you know horses as there is around the country i think there's something very conducive for horses training in this great climate in california so yeah for me it's something i you, you know i hope i'm training here for many years to come it's um things have thinned out a little bit and you know it's um you know seems to be changing where it's just racing at the weekends um but hopefully we can sustain some good clients and um continue racing here because it's um something i'm you know very fond of and i, I should stress just for one or two correspondents who've got in touch with me that i'm completely with you there um, but I know how passionate you are, so I wanted to hear it hear it from you and and Brittany, obviously. I, I'm born and raised here, so I can't envision living anywhere else. Um, I I love the racing and other parts of not just the country, but but the world. But to me, there's nothing like racing in Southern California. And I'm not just living in the glory days when you know we had incredible runners at the track, like the Santa Anita. Is still to me the great race place and i see i've seen so much energy uh time love passion put into getting it back to where it was and it's going to take time and it's going to take commitment from trainers like simon owners like he has like my father has but there's nothing like being there really any day of the year looking at the san gabriel mountains or being down in del mar you look to your left you've got the ocean you look to your right you've got the jimmy durani turf course at del mar i mean look at you, you can see the sun popping out behind simon i've got this beautiful weather behind me. I can't say enough about Southern California racing and I hope people fight for it the way that it deserves to be fought for. Brittany, how, how long did it take them to move the palm trees into the back of your shot today? Been working on it all day. How do, how do you think it looks? Should I have it, moved? Looks a, right. it looks amazing. I, every week it's a different backdrop and this is the best by far. <laughs> I'm just really worried that the gardeners are all of a sudden going to come in. It's going to be really loud or that my computer is going to die. One or the other. Um, I think we're ready to drink. Yeah. Is, is Simon going to drink with us? Do you want to stay? Uh, yeah. Cool. Sure. Or, is he, or are we, re or are we releasing him into the wild? Drink, sure. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Guys, I'm super excited. Our first drink tonight is called the Breakfast Martini. We're going to be doing a vodka variation of it. And it was created by Salvatore Calabrese. He's known within the industry as the maestro, so the teacher. Now, Salvatore is legendary on so many different levels. Not only was he the former president of the UK Bartenders Guild, he also was instrumental in developing the famous martini at the Duke's Bar. Nick, maybe you're familiar. That, that martini is known across the world as probably being well, the best martini I'll, in the world. I'll tell you a funny story about the martini at Duke's and St. James's, which I'm sure Callie's been to. Um, I, I've seen I, I've seen people attempt three martinis in there, yeah. and um, uh, they, they have to be stretched out. So <laughs> the, the point is you go in there for a pre-dinner drink. It's very civilized but very cramped. The trolley comes around, famous maitre d', does your martini and what you don't realize is there's the equivalent of about six measures in each in each martini yeah and you know people think they're quite clever pre-christmas or whatever and they can get you know a couple down them that'll do you that'll do you in, in that'll do you in cold blood 
Never Absolutely. think you can take. Never think you can take on the the Duke's martini. The third one. You have to. You have to have utmost respect for it. Utmost respect. Absolutely. So so Salvatore was one of many people. I guess one of a few uh, really instrumental people that helped bring it about that amazing legendary martini. But he also was very interested in acquiring and purveying vintage spirits. So really, really old liqueurs and, and liquors. And he actually briefly held the Guinness World Record for the most expensive cocktail. It called for uh, cognac from 1788, Kumel liqueur, which is kind of a caraway and fennel liqueur from 1770. He had curacao in there, like an orange liqueur from 1860, and some Angostura bitters from the 1900s. So I'll let you guess how much that cocktail cost at the time. Any any guess in pounds or dollars? Oh. What year again? Like old martini right now. Yeah, so this was back around, actually 2012 is when he made the martini. Oh. Uh, 10,000 pounds. 10,000 10, pounds. Well, that's actually above what it was, but <laughs> it was 5,500 pounds. So that would be about... $7,200. It was the most expensive cocktail. And now that's since been beaten by another cocktail created by uh, an Australian bartender, which is $12,500. So crazy, crazy prices when you get into the vintage spirits. Uh, but it just goes to show, like Salvatore believes, uh, almost tasting history. So experiencing the, these liqueurs and spirits that were around from the end of the Civil War or even before that. All right, so in addition to that, of course, Salvatore has come up with some enduring classic cocktails, one of which is the breakfast martini. Now, as a proud Italian man, Salvatore started every day off with an espresso, but he didn't really want to eat anything. But he was married to, and is still married to an English woman, Sue, who insisted that he would have something for breakfast to accompany his espresso. So one day she made him a little piece of toast with some orange marmalade on it. And Salvatore, being the bartender just like me, he got to thinking, how can I incorporate this into a cocktail? So that's really what led him to creating the breakfast martini. We're gonna make it right now. You're gonna need only four things. We're gonna need some fresh lemon juice, orange liqueur, so we'll be using triple sec. I love Cointreau, as you guys know. Typically, the breakfast martini calls for gin. We're gonna be using Tito's handmade vodka. And what makes it so unique and different is that we're gonna be using some orange marmalade. So this is really one of the first cocktails in the modern times that incorporated a jelly or jam into a cocktail. And uh, for me, one of the, the best parts about that is, you know, in cocktails and conversations, I try to keep it pretty simple with the syrups and the ingredients. I try not to give you strawberry syrup or raspberry syrup, but the beauty of a jam or a preserve is that the work is done for you. You've got fresh fruit that has been preserved with sugar, which we're gonna put into the cocktail anyway. So if you wanna experiment at home without having to come up with these fruit syrups, Jams are a great way to do it. Mark, Mark, jelly, I, my jam is your jelly, right? Your jelly is my jam. I guess so. I, for me, jelly is without what? seeds and stuff, right? And then jam has some seeds and preserves have even more fruit. I don't know the exact distinction, but we, we, we could say my jam is your jelly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's adorable. I just, I feel like that was like a love statement. Your jam I think my so too. Jelly. Find a way to frame that statement. Really cute. Are you a breakfast guy, Simon? Uh, not so much, actually. We're going to change your mind here. There you go. <laughs> so, guys, for everyone making this at home, I know the Dickinsons are doing this. I think they made it earlier tonight. But we started off with one really heaping spoon, or you could even do a spoon and a half of the marmalade directly into the mixing tin. And when you do that, keep the spoon in there. And I'll show you why. We're going we're gonna to stir it in just a minute. But let's go ahead and add three quarters of an ounce of fresh lemon juice. And we're gonna follow that. Anytime we have that sour, of course, we wanna balance it out with the sweet. I know you guys have heard me say all these things a million times on cocktails and conversation. Let's add the Cointreau, so our triple sec, the same amount, the three quarters of an ounce. Well, that's Nick and I, right? Mixing the sour with the sweet? Exactly. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where I get the inspiration for these things. I kind of build the cocktails off of the whole relationship, <laughs> that dynamic. And finally, the strong. So we have the sour, the sweet, and the strong. No, 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 not very strong. But we're gonna add two ounces of our Tito's into our mixing tin. And that's it. So it's just those four ingredients. But when you're working with jams and jellies, I find it helps actually give it a little stir before we add the ice. You just wanna make sure you're kind of incorporating that jam, loosening it up a little bit. 
All right. That's pretty much it, guys. We're going to add some ice. We're going to give this a good shake. Simon, if you weren't aware, we've been coming up with horse names while Mark has been making cocktails. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So if you like any of them, please go tell Kaleem, uh, and then we'll, we will not. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, exactly. Some work better than others, but I think we have a pretty good track record. True. My jam right, is your jelly, I think, would work well in, in the States. <laughs> is it two-minute think... character? No. Right? I think That's that, fine. well, it's definitely the leading choice for this week, but I'm going to go ahead and give this a good shake. Make sure you shake this one very vigorously. You want to incorporate all of those little bits of jam and dough. All right. Now, you guys know that I'm a big proponent of the fine strain, especially when we've muddled any fruit, or in this case, because we do have little bits of kind of the peels and things from the marmalade. So we're going to go ahead and pour from our mixing tin through our fine strainer into a martini glass. And that's pretty much it, guys. That is our that looks breakfast good. martini. Do I need some good. waffles and syrup to go along with it or goes with anything? You know, people get really creative with some of these themed cocktails. Just like we've, we've spoken about the Bloody Mary and the sliders and the shrimp cocktail and all that. You'd be surprised the things that I see on some of these cocktails. But we, we can keep it very simple. We could do some orange peel as a garnish, just to get those nice kind of orange notes on top. That same little piece of that toast. The most yellow orange I've ever seen. It looks like a lemon, oh, this, a very large lemon. Oh, they, oh yeah, the, the, the orange itself was a little pale, but <laughs> there's plenty of flavor in here. We've got our toast to go along with it. However you start your day, it's probably not best to start it this way, but brunch time, why not? Cheers yeah. guys, that's the breakfast martini. Cheers, cheers, cheers Mark, cheers. well done, good call. Ah, and cheers to Bellafina this weekend in the ballerina. Doesn't that just roll off your tongue, Bellafina in the ballerina? It's gonna work. Uh, It'll work. Let's hope so. <laughs> the only thing we listen. The only thing we didn't talk about with Bellafina, Cali, was the opposition. <laughs> um, so how's it gonna how's it gonna shake down? Well, I think Serengeti Empress from the one hole is, you know, if she runs her a race, then we'll we'll all have to have our running shoes on to beat her. Um, she's probably the one that I, you know, fear most. Um, but you know, collectively, it's a it's a very solid group of um, of uh, older mares, and you know, it's kind of what you expect to be running in a Grade One at Saratoga. Um, but um, yeah, let's hope we're kind of in the thick of it at the finish. Good luck to gonna... you. Thank you for spending your let's see, forty three minutes with us. And having a glass of wine, we so appreciate it. Good luck this weekend, mm -hmm. uh, not just with Bellafina. I know you have plenty of other runners here at Del Mar. So, cheers and good luck. All right, guys, take Thank it easy. Very much. Cheers, cheers Kelly. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Bye. Ah, oh, good stuff. That that photo, the jockey photo, was great. Yeah, you, you you're still thinking about that, aren't you? Yeah, that was great. You're just, yeah, you're still <laughs> that's you're still rolling that round. Yep. Just yeah. Gonna, uh, <laughs> like Simon back when he was riding. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, speaking you know, of writing, you can get that Simon back if you just, you know. <clears throat> <we're d> <laughs> a big hello to Javier Castellano, Hall of Fame writer, uh, six time Javi Travers winner. You hold the record going for another victory this weekend. First and foremost, how are you? Good, Brittany. How are you? Oh, we're doing good. We're, we're moving along. We just made a breakfast martini, which was delicious. I heard you wrapped up the day at Saratoga with a victory. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, now we look at this big weekend ahead, but for you, because we haven't had the opportunity to speak to too many jockeys on here, Mike a bit, Frankie a bit. What has it been like during this pandemic riding without the fans? I know you had your own experience with COVID-19 and, and spoke pretty openly about how difficult that was. It was difficult. I think mentally it was more difficult than like anything else. Um, I was, thank God, I was asymptomatic. Um, I didn't have any symptoms. Um, I just took more mentally every single day, think it was going to happen today or tomorrow or the next week. Um, if it, something happened, you don't have a medicine, you don't have anything. If you ask the doctor what I need to do, it says, Sit still away if something happened, call 911 and they let you know and let it know you have the COVID. I said, Oh my God, <laughs> it's scary. Uh, but thank God, all the quarantine went through a nice and smooth. 
And the news this week, Harvey, that if and when you go to ride in Kentucky for the Derby, you have to be there two weeks in advance. So I think 22nd, 23rd of August. How, what's been the, what's been the reaction to that in, in New York? That's crazy. Nick. I think it's very, very unfair for every single rider in, in the country. <clears throat> you can see that the best race of the country, the Kentucky Derby, that's the dream. When you sign in, you uh, you to be to apply to be jockey, your first license, your first dream is say, I want to be the Derby. I want to ride the Derby. I want to win the Derby. That's the first thing it can to your mind. And then they block it like that way. I say it's unfair because you have to be two weeks before you're not able to ride it. And then you, when you come back to New York, you have to be another 10 days, basically 14 plus 10, 24 days. I think it's very, very unfair. This time of the year, I think this is the best time of the year for the jockeys to perform to to best of the best we are in Saratoga. I think it's unfair for every single one. I mean, it's a lot of business that you're missing by doing that. Granted, yes, you'll probably get plenty of mounts if you go to Kentucky, but it's all the business from regular horses that you ride and trainers that you work with in Saratoga. Um, have you made that decision yet, whether or not you're going to go? We don't know yet, Brittany. We still wait what's going to happen Saturday and the travel, what's going to, how it's going to perform my horse. And um, all the horses, what's gonna happen with the future to teach the law? And um, you you never know, that's whole race. Teach, teach the law, he can win by 10, but he can get beat too. I mean, um, it's um, an unpredictable game. I think it, that's the most excited because whole race, anything can happen in the race. I see a lot of long shots win the race, including myself, where I beat an American father called Whiskey Eyes. <laughs> You're still enjoying that, aren't you? All the, five years later, you're still enjoying that. I, I, absolutely. Nick, everything I handicap in the race that day and um, say, how can I be that horse? How can I be American father? It's the only spin in the race. My horse comes from way back. And more you handicap in the race, the more I say it's unbeatable, the horse. But anyway, I'm going to do the best to go. I'm going to give you the best, best rider to bring it a whole good, good race. Ended up to win the race at the driver. It was an a, absolutely amazing performance. But I, your record in this race is insane. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just that you've won it a whole bunch of times, five, six times. It's the fact that you've done all of them in the last in the last decade. A Fleet mm -hmm. Express, Day Thirsty, VE Day, Keen Ice, then Catholic Boy, all very different types of horse. And a lot of them putting in those, you know, giant killing performances that Saratoga is famous for. Do you think it's just the, the time of year the race normally comes that that creates those shocks, or is it something about the track? What what is it that sometimes throws up those slightly funky results? And they call it graveyard of the champions, right? For a reason. <laughs> I, don't know about that. I think I don't know. It's, it's, it's weird because you got to be in the right time, in the right place. You need to have a horse. But I guess very fortunate to be in that spot, you know, because if you analyze it myself, I win six travel, three travel with a low, long shot, and three travel. It was horses, pretty light horses, like mm -hmm. VE Day. I have no idea I'm going to win the travel and win the travel. I flip spray. King mm -hmm. Eyes, those three bigger long shots and the Travis. That's what I mean. I think the most I like this game, you never know what's going to happen. You don't know the result. We can predict something, but the result is always going to be different, or sometimes it's going to be what we thought about it. And that's the side of whole race. Can we relive this race with the sound here? I got to hear that call one more time. Oh, no, he's gone. It's I gone. Not, I guess not. Well, because Javier, we had the opportunity to speak with Dale Roman. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Still no sound. <laughs> well, we're well, anyway, anyway, he's still excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I celebrate. 
So you're celebrating. What was, do you remember what the crowd was doing at that time to watch the Triple Crown champion get beat? It was like a way. Yeah. I mean, it's like a roller coaster. A lot of people, they celebrate one side and one people, they really are in shock. Mm -hmm. I say, this is the, the best of the horse for a long, long time. This is the Triple Crown horse. It's unbeatable. And he got beat. Fortunately, that's whole race. I think he, you never know. Unbelievable. I mean, that, that race is one that people, and I know you, because you're still smiling about it, will not forget for some time. We had a great question, and I actually would mm -hmm. love to hear the response to this as well. It was from Gary. Gary said, can you tell us about your journey to become a jockey in the U.S. and how it all started for you? Well, my father was a jockey. My father mm -hmm. rode for 25 years in my country. I'm from Venezuela, um, but I had no idea to come to the United States to ride horses. Uh, I think a uh, one jockey from Venezuela, he performed here a long time ago in 1980s, Douglas Valientes, and he did really well in Gulf Street compared with the top pride. I think he was a leading jockey in by then, 19, late 1980s, 89, 90s, something like that. Mm -hmm. And he always told me, you got to go to, you got to try, you have to perform, you write good, you got to go to the United States. I said, no, it's going to be too tough for me. I'd rather to be here in Venezuela. And that, by that time, it was a brand day. I want to win. Uh, I win a lot of races by then. I changed my mind. I decided to come to here, try for a little couple, maybe a couple of weeks, one month, see how it go. And the more you win, the more you like it. <laughs> I said, no, this is good. <laughs> I don't want to leave. I want to stay here. There you go. I'm here. Thank God. I think it was a good decision. What do you think, Nick? <laughs> uh, I think it was an amazing decision. Uh, the one, the one, earliest memory i have personally of of meeting javi which he will well he might remember but i'm not i'm not sure because i'm not sure how good his his memory was that that night was uh the night of the breeders cup classic and and bernardini who we we all expected to win and he'd held all before him and you'd had that horrible fall earlier on in the in the day and you had to pick yourself up and you had to go on tv and everyone was jostling you and you kind of tried to get yourself together and you had to go out and ride the Breeders' Cup Classic favorite. And I was just incredibly impressed by how you handled that whole that whole situation. That must have been an extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult night for you. It, it really tough. Uh, I think I believe jockeys, um, you got to be strong physically and most important, you have to be strong mentally. I think mm -hmm. you got to go through a lot, a lot of emotions. Um, up and down, like you say, in the beginning, um, I was so excited to perform Bernardini and the British Cup Classic that day. But at the same time, unfortunately, I have a pass spell, the horse broke down and, and early in the race, I think the British Cup, this stuff, mm. and Pan Island for Chumagehe, Fig family. And um, it's pretty sad. I mean, and the Phillies, she was one of the favorite in the, in the British Cup, in the staff for the Phillies. And um, unfortunately, you know, it, she brought down, I think, it got by step. And, that's, and it was pretty rough because you hit the ground and you physically, you, you mentally, you, what's going on here? And then your body sore. But at the same time, you're excited because you, I want to win the British Cup Classic game. Mm -hmm. And the year before, I went with Gosa in 2004. Mm -hmm. It was my my first British Cup in Lone Star, Texas. And, you know, you want to keep continuing your momentum. You are so excited. You want to be part of the, the game. You want to be, you know, be in top. And you have to do it the best you could. Um, I did, unfortunately, you know, um, I finished second with Invasor, one of the best horses too in the ground by then. And it went by and it beat me. I think it, that night was pretty rough for us. But I think I went through and made me be more stronger longer and mm -hmm. be continue to be successful. And and you, you mentioned Go Sapper there. And I I wanted to, to talk about him as well because people talk about the litany of greats in the last couple of decades and he hardly ever gets a mention. He was insane the time he ran in the in the Breeders' Cup Classic and and what he did, the speed he showed and the ability to stretch his speed. Mm -hmm. Would you would you say he's the best horse you've ridden? By far. 
by far Nick and Brina, you can see, I, I believe, if I'm not wrong, I think I know the record, 159 and change, British Scott Classic. Uh, I, don't think so, I think so far, nobody beat that, uh, that, that record. Um, usually the whole, it comes from behind, and that day, Mane Quota um, ended up with the lead. And he beat a lot of good horses like Roses and May. After that race at Roses mm -hmm. and May, he went to ride and went to run in the, the Dubai World Cup. But he won mm -hmm. the Dubai World Cup. Aseri, the good feeling, pleasant and perfect. One horse, he won the wow. British Cup Classic the year before with Mandela, Mr. Mandela. A lot, a lot of good horses. And, and, and funny side, he won the Kentucky Derby the year before and the pregnant. A lot of good horses, he beat the horse. I think he, the good thing about Gosap is he's, he's, he has different style. You can be in the lead, you can be come from behind, you can be in the middle. And he has the horse too. The question you have, what do you think is the best? And um, it's the best because he won great one in the short distance, mm -hmm. in the middle distance, mm -hmm. and the man and quarter. Mm -hmm. You don't see the horse, he won great one, six foot on a sprinter, right? And go stretch him out a quarter. He won another great one. I think he's very impressive. When people, and, and you say, Nick, that they don't talk about him enough as one of the greats, but when they do talk yeah. about true greatness and the ability to win these high level races, sprinting and stretching out like he did, he is always the one yeah. that always. Well, he, he should be. He should be. And, and it's because he could sprint for a mile and a quarter. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's, there's very few horses that can, that can do that. And I, you know, I wonder whether, I wonder whether people experiment enough. I wonder whether people are prepared to be as versatile as you guys were with Go Sapper then. Now they've got more options. They've got more options to take in races over different distances. Whether they're they're less uh, open to taking risks as as we were, you know, fifteen twenty years ago. I think I give you credit to Bobby Frank the way he trained mm. the horse. One of the master I ever see. And the way he trained the horse, because nobody believed the horse. He was only sprinted by then. Mm -hmm. And he come from way behind, way, way. Sprinter Ray always come from behind. He went and then he stretched him out all the way to mile and a quarter. And the British Classic and the best of the best with the, who come with the best horses in the country. I think I give you the, try, give you the credit to the training, the, the job he did with the horse. I mean, remar remarkable horse. I, I want to go back to what you were talking about, the mentality, though, um, for a jockey and how challenging it can be. You have really tough days. You have really high days. Are you able to step away from the track and decompress? And how do you distract yourself? Do you need that sometimes as a rider to step away from the racing frame of it all? I think so. I think you have to balance it. Everything is balanced in the life. Yeah. You can be one all in dementia. I think uh, if you and focus too much with the races, it, I mean, it's good. Don't get me wrong, because you got to be on top of the game. But at the same time, you get like sour mentally and you get like the same routine. You don't want to get involved in that. I think the most important, you have to be fresh, but at the same time, be on top of the game. Mm -hmm. And the only you balance a little bit, I think in myself, we have a pretty rough day and try to go away a little bit with my family. I love being involved with my family, my kids, my wife, and I think it, a little break. I mean, two, three days go away. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, hard to go out with are just very demanded, like weekend. But let's it's still like one Monday, Tuesday. Let's go away some part. Let's go mm -hmm. to something. Let's do something different. Just to freshen up a little bit, you might enjoy the life too outside the racetrack and then mm -hmm. go back to the races and be fresh and focus and try to win the best race in the country. Uh, well, you mentioned new things and keeping yourself distracted. Word has it, you're in the TikTok. Oh, I love it. I called, I called it Tic Tac before because I'm not cool <laughs> enough to know what that is. <laughs> you don't know what TikTok is? Well, now I do, but initially I called I'm it Tic Tac. On, I'm on TikTok, I've got two followers. Oh, really? There you go. All right. So I, I've uh, heard and we're going to bring up a video that's just too adorable for words. Uh, Baby, come give me something. Oh. Baby, come give me something. Oh. Cause I can't stop. Loving. 
Here's to the Castellanos. I love it. You guys look like you have so much fun between making pizza, doing TikTok dances, uh, being out, I think, on the trampoline you showed me once. It, it's all about um, the balance. But where'd the dance moves come from, Javi? My family, <laughs> the Latin, Hispanic music, and eh, do this. And it was <laughs> it was a pretty good idea. Um, even my dog, he looked at me like, what's going on in the video? He said, why well, everybody does that? No, but it was fun. It was in the, I think, I believe, March. March 15th, after March 15th, when everybody, basically the country, they lock him up and great stop races and no mm -hmm. racing, no school. And we ended up at that week and we have to do something fun. Let's enjoy that week. Let's do pizza. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's dance a little bit. And my, my two girls, she's 14 and 11, you know, Nick and I know Brittany, about TikTok and everything. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, not sure you want to, I'm not sure you want to see me try. I'm, unlike you, I have no rhythm. I think we need a cocktails and conversations TikTok, and we'll just have a, a special um, celebrity jump in by Javi. Be great. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I, it's fun because in the karaoke every year, I don't know how to sing it, but I can dance it. I told guy, we need to put somebody who can sing it, and I'm behind dancing. <laughs> You're, you're talking about the jockey karaoke that has been taking place in Saratoga for years. And recently here in Del Mar, all to benefit the permanently disabled jockeys fund. I'm so sad that that can't be held this year. But um, you and your wife, I'd say year in and year out, show up. Who who creates the uh, the dance moves, the costumes, chooses the song? Is that all you? My wife, of course. I, I can't do this. <laughs> I used to follow with the protocol. They tell me what to do. I just follow it. <laughs> and this is the, the the competition between East and West is fiercer than the debate we have on this show as to which is best out of Del Mar and Saratoga. That's it's insane. That's that's fine. That's the the, the best thing because you you ended up the competitive game, of course, and we want to be the East Coast. If, if, East Coast, you want to be the West Coast. And it's it's fun because it, you encourage encourage yourself to do it really well. Let's mm -hmm. have something fun, but at the same time, I don't want to get beat. I want to win. I want to win. You know how the jockey they are. They all, always yeah. want to win. <laughs> It's too good. It's too good. Joe Talamo, who's not on the West Coast anymore, got very into it each year. But uh, last year was Iggy Puglisi and his wife that took it away. So the West will hold on to that for another year. <laughs> yeah, of course. And they will challenge you. They will challenge you at TikTok and they will challenge you at the uh, at the karaoke competition. But they're not going to challenge you on the tennis court, right? No, not at all. I can't do that. I tried to do it. I, I think I need more practice. Because my two girls, they're really good. Even my wife, they're really good about tennis. <laughs> So I'm a massive tennis fan, and obviously things are changing this year. The U.S. Open, a lot of tennis players are pulling out. But have you followed the game religiously for a long time? Well, the last couple of years, my wife, she really fell in love about tennis. And now my girls, they play almost every single day here in Saratoga and Long Island. And they follow it every single day. And the last four or five years we've been going to the U.S. Open, it's unbelievable. We have a lot, a lot of fun. And, and it's enjoy. I mean, I did have a, um, oh, I met the one, the player, I think Rene, I forgot the last name, she from Australia. She really champion in MASH, the girl, mm -hmm. and, Oh, Renette. was that Bianca? No, she was the, the Canadian. Renette. Oh, Ash, Ash Barty won recently, but she, um... she came to Saratoga last year. Mm -hmm. And oh, we have the best time. We and we made it, we talk a lot. Renee uh, Stubbs. Renee Stubbs. Renee Stubbs. Yes. Oh, a retired player. I thought currently. Yeah. The Australian, yeah. the Australian tennis player. Yeah. Yeah. Do really uh, you have a favorite she... player? She follow the horses, she watch races, and, and and she don't play anymore, but she teach people. And she always involved in US Open. I think mm -hmm. she work in TV too, and the media. And she's really good, she's mm -hmm. she one of the best. Do you have a favorite player? Um, 
of course, Roger Federer, one of the best. I mean, he's, he's such a great guy. His personality, the way he conducted himself, uh, mm -hmm. I think he's truly champion. Of course, Nadal, uh, Rafael Nadal is one of the best. Uh, um, and just Kadesh, uh, you can take it away anything. Mm -hmm. He's one of the best. Those three, two, three players, mm -hmm. I think he's one of the best in the country. Andy Murray. Andy, Andy Murray. Anyone, Andy Murray? <laughs> 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 Sorry. No, no. <laughs> we include no one. Andy Roddick back in the day for the US. But... Hang on a minute. Murray's <laughs> much better than Roddick was. Yeah, but Andy Roddick is from America, so he's going to get the support. <laughs> Game set match. You are, I'm yeah, out. You're, you're outweighed here. <laughs> I'm out. Uh -oh. Now, uh, are we drinking again? We, we can drink again. I was just going to ask Javi about his Travers Mount. Katakaro, is that how you say? Oh, that, that old race. Correct. Oh yeah, that old race. I mean, lightly raced, but he's shown a lot of talent and a few starts. How are you feeling taking on the big tis the law? And I guess Uncle Chuck is getting so much attention. Mm. It's correct. I think Brittany is a kind of type of old Nick. He been proved. You can see the first two races on the in the beginning of the year, mm -hmm. and he was pretty impressed. And then, unfortunately, the got hurt, and they bring it from January all the way to in the middle of the, the year, basically, in July. We have a six-month and different race trap, two turn, man and eight. I think the, the Hoy just came a couple of days before to the race and to perform in the Peter Pan. I think it's so many much to ask the whole in the <laughs> short time and still the whole you perform really well you just got be like this half a length with the one of the best horses two in the ground and i think he he's kind of improved and i think he well bred the whole i think he now man and quarter is gonna fit per perfect for the horse mm -hmm. i think it, they have a little gap right there to prove the horses belong to the race mm -hmm. And and if you win seven Travers, what are they gonna? Is that if there isn't a statue of you already at Saratoga? <laughs> I mean, never mind the never mind the Jerry Bailey Museum or whatever. It, it's <laughs> no, you know, move aside. <laughs> Unbelievable! I think it, that's the, the one the race that you're looking for in the year. Of course, don't get me wrong. You're looking for the Kentucky Derby in the beginning of the year, and and then. It, it, they always, I always say, to me, it's really important that race because all the horses they perform in the beginning of the year, the early stage, you rush a little bit the horses to perform the Kentucky Derby. Actually, let's put it that way. Before to the Derby, you have to qualify all those spread races, the Florida Derby, the Kentucky, the, 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 the Luciana Derby, the Wood mm -hmm. Memorial, all those type of races. You have to crack him out the horse to, to win the race and then qualify mm -hmm. to win the Kentucky Derby, the pregnant and the bell. Mm -hmm. And then you can see a lot of horses, they start developing himself. Some horses, they had young, quick, you know, develop it. Some horses, they don't. They late like, develop it. They have mm -hmm. a lot of potential, but you need to leave a space to grow. Mm -hmm. And by that time, you, you in January, February, March, now you ended up to crank him out the horse, and then you have to a little break one, two months. The horse they grow up and mentally and physically, the horse they grow. And mm -hmm. after they grow the horses, that's the race you look for to win the trolley yeah. because that's when you ended up to the best three year old Kentucky mm -hmm. Derby winner, Prigny winner, Palmer mm -hmm. winner. They all ended up in the same spot. Unfortunately, you know, this year is crazy because there are a lot of moving. Right. And, and, but usually it's that kind of type of race like we all looking for because they're all three best three year on the country. They hook up together and you see how they perform it. And then hopefully he win the travel. He can win the British Cup Classic at the mm -hmm. end of the yeah. year. That yeah. to me, the travel won the bigger race is really important to me. It's the Midsummer Derby. It's a prestigious race in and of itself. Yes, this year it's a Kentucky Derby prep, but 
the Travers is the Travers. It needs no introduction. Uh, I can't wait to see that coming up this weekend. And also, you're riding the defending champ in the ballerina, Come Dancing. Yeah, I love that feeling. I think, it, you know, last year, for some reason, didn't have the best trip in the British Cup Classic. And the, the one in the, in the British Cup, the, the Phyllis Mayor, and um, I think it... You know, and after that, they give a layoff and then they bring it back. I think the Apple Pass, up. she didn't perform well. Mm -hmm. And then the last time, I think I've excused a little bit. I think it should be trying it really good now. Uh, I like the pose, a lot of spin the race. And um, one, the, the, that's the good thing about her when she won the ballerina last year, she didn't did take the pay. She can be in the lead, but she can be off the pay too to, to perform the best way to do that. And I think it Saturday, I think I have a lot of opportunity. I have a good ball, a lot of speed in the race. You see how they develop the race. And I think hey, let's take advantage of the speed duel and maybe hopefully can run it with the race. Javi, it's been a it's been a pleasure to, to have you with us uh, this week. Great insight and you're such a, a professional. Best of luck at the weekend and, and hopefully at the end of the year you can continue that amazing winning streak with at least one Breeders' Cup winner that you've had for the last eight years. Javier Castellano, thank you very much. Take care. Thank you thank so you much. Me. Absolute you, back. So. Top man. Is that the there he is. There he is. <laughs> he's back in coffee? my life. He's back in my life. <laughs> I, just, I just finished my breakfast and now I'm moving on to the coffee. Everything's going back oh, today. What's the difference between jam and marmalade? Jam and marmalade. For me. We were talking I, I feel like marmalade has bits of the, the peel in there, right? That's what gives it a little bit of the bitterness. Jam for me has some of the seeds and jelly mm. is basically just the gelatinous, sweet, fruity yeah. stuff. Yeah, I think that's More it. Like I think marmalade has to have citrus based rind yes. included yes. in the in the in the in the mix. Absolutely. You guys <laughs> talking about jam and jelly and marmalade, I'm gonna go refill my wine. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, guys, I'm super excited to be making a take on the Irish coffee because what warms your soul more than a hot Irish coffee? But it's the middle of August, so we don't want to do that. We want to cool down. So we're going to be making a great take on the Irish coffee called the Kentucky Cold Brew. But before we get to that, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the history of the Irish coffee itself. So it was created back in 1943 by Joe Sheridan. He was the chef at a restaurant at an air base uh, just outside of Limerick, Ireland. And this airbase was sort of like a layover point for intercontinental flights. So people would come in, they would refuel, and oftentimes, because of the inclement weather, the passengers would have to stay overnight at this airbase. And usually it was very, very cold. So on one of those chilly nights, Joe decided to warm up those passengers by serving them a mixture of whiskey, brown sugar, coffee, and cream. It became known as the Irish coffee. Now, according to Joe, a true, is a tea. We're that, being told by Aiden Butler that Irish coffee is a tea. Is a tea. Wow. Okay. All right. That's, I, I accept every single <laughs> argument. We're going to have to get into that one later on. Irish but, coffee uh, is a tea. It's a tea. I'm not oh, going to. Are you, are you thinking maybe Irish breakfast tea? Or maybe this is a bigger conversation. But I, I, I like, I always love Irish coffee in is a tea. I put, there you go. All right. Hey, listen, I got to tell you, as a bartender, one of, one of my favorite things is hearing new information. So Aiden, follow up with that. Please teach me something because I'm a sponge. I love to learn new things. Um, but in Look the meantime, so Dad brings me some wine. Dad, come say hi. Wow. Hey, everybody. <laughs> hey, Pete. hey, how's it going? So how's it going, you guys? Mark is rounding Good. us out with our final cocktail of the evening. Well, where's mine? Go, got to go inside to make I it. We're going to learn how to make it right now. She forgot to buy it. You, you guys have been making the cocktails right along throughout the series, right? Yeah, but without my wife here, uh, no such luck. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> hey, Pete, well, listen, we, we figured out the difference between jam and marmalade anyway, so we're learning. Yeah, we're, we're, learning. we're making slow okay. progress here, but we're making okay. progress nonetheless. Well, I'm glad right. you guys that out. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's so nice to see you. All right, you guys, enjoy. Cheers. Thanks, Dad. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, tea aside, Joe Sheridan said that a true Irish coffee, and I may have to look down to my notes here, should have cream as rich as an Irish brogue, coffee, 
strong as a friendly hand, sugar as sweet as the tongue of a rogue, Nick, whiskey, <laughs> whiskey as smooth as the wit of the land. So these basic elements, we've got coffee, we've got some sweetness, we've got that. cream. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice little kind of rhyme to remember it. But so I think our Kentucky cold brew has all those elements. I'm going to walk you through it. One of the beautiful things about this cocktail is we're going to build it right in our glass. Now, obviously, this is not a traditional Irish coffee mug because it's going to be cold. And we are going to go ahead and start with this good stuff. We're going to do an ounce and a half of Maker's Mark bourbon directly into our glass. So mm -hmm. we're not going to have to shake or stir this one outside of the glass. We're going to pour that right in. And now the next thing we want to do is we want to, we have to move on to our sweetness now, right? So we're going to rogue add a tongue, little... Rogue tongue, horse name, maybe? As, as well, maybe. He likes I it. Think we're, we're going to get a couple horse names from this episode, mm. I think. But there's something with the jam and the marmalade. I don't know what it is, but there's something there. Yeah. Somebody said love statement, and I really like that. Love statement. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, why not? See, this is like a, like a brain trust right here. We've just come up with good ideas, I think. Uh, probably not me, but you guys for the most part. Um, so we've got three quarters of an ounce of Demerara syrup. So before you came on, Nick, Brittany was asking about the difference between kind of brown sugar, Demerara sugar, sugar in the raw. A lot of it comes down did she, to the I mean, did, did she really want to know or was she just trying to fill time before I came on? It was probably a bit of both. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> You'll but never I, I think, know. <laughs> I think it served its purpose. But so for you, Nick, and for any viewers that maybe weren't awake at that point, uh, you know, white sugar is obviously very refined. Uh, brown sugar is oftentimes actually white sugar, so refined sugar that's had molasses added to it, which is one of the reasons why it has that sort of cakey consistency in the bag. Um, whereas sugar in the raw or demerara sugar is sugar cane juice that has been kind of cooked down in the process of crystallizing the sugar. But they that's what Mick, that's that's what Mick Jagger is saying, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, put into a centrifuge, and then you get these large crystals. So that's what we're making this syrup out of today. Um, but any sort of brown sugar or sugar in the raw works well for this recipe. So three quarters of an ounce. You're on fire tonight, Nick. On point. The humor is up there. Wow. Well, that's what Robert says. Yeah. I wasn't even is reading there any, that. Is there any way that we can get Nick to lose his sound again? Is that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Careful what you wish for, Mark. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> Seventeen and the shots are fired. Brittany's not got much. Brittany's got much battery left. It'll just be you and me. Oh, that's true. That's true. All right, guys. Now we're gonna do our coffee. We're gonna add four ounces of cold brew. Now I know cold brew is sort of this trendy thing that's caught on in recent years, but it is so easy to make it in your own house. Uh, so, have you guys ever done like French press coffee, where you get the large grinds? The the French no. Nick? No. I got your egg, Mark. Oh, okay. All right. Well, if you, go to, if you go to a store like Starbucks or something and you ask for your coffee to be ground to French press, basically what it means is that the grinds are very coarse. So they're very large. They're easy to strain out. So that's ideal for making your own cold room. So the best way to do it is you combine one part of those ground coffee beans with four parts, like a nice distilled water, mix it up and let it sit for 12 hours. Strain it out. You've got your own cold brew. You don't have to spend tons of money on an expensive chain, but it's very easy to make at home. Great for this recipe. All right, guys, at this point, we are going to add some ice to our glass. And then we're going to work on that final component, which is going to be the cream to float on top. All right. Now, for those of you that were looking at the recipe that maybe I posted ahead of time, it said lightly whipped cream. So when you think of what goes on top of an Irish coffee, you actually don't really want the stiff peaks of like a traditional whipped cream. You want something that's gonna kind of lit literally just float on top of the coffee. Now you can do that with a hand mixer, just don't do it to the point where it's like the stiff peaks. I'm really trying to avoid things that Nick's gonna make fun of me for. I don't know if you guys can tell, um, but I'm gonna show you a very cool way to do this in your cocktail shaking tin. So we're gonna take some heavy cream here or whipping cream, and we're gonna do about, I'd say three ounces into the whip, uh, into the cocktail tin. Now we're actually not gonna add any ice to this. Now, if you guys have been using this type of strainer at home, this is called a Hawthorne strainer. This is a common bar tool. But what's really cool is that on the other side, it has that spring. I don't know if you guys can see that. That mm -hmm. spring yeah. can actually come off. 
So you can take this off. And if you put this inside of your cocktail shaker, it basically acts like a whisk. So we don't need to add any ice. We're gonna drop that directly into our tin with the cream. And now we're gonna shake this without ice, just to kind of aerate and slightly whip this cream. Doesn't really sound like much. You just kind of hear that spring floating around in there. But this is gonna aerate the cream so that it sits nicely on top of the coffee. Hmm. Little MacGyver hack here. I like it. All right. Okay. So now the other thing is that when we layer this on top, Oh, wow, it actually whipped up a lot here. Mm. So we're going to use this spoon. And oh, the, has, old back, the old back of the spoon job, is it? Yeah, exactly. But this actually yeah. whipped up pretty nice. Oh, you, so yeah. I kind of over whipped it here, I think. Mm. But we're still going to do it over the back of the spoon for good measure. All right. And this is going to cause it to sit really nicely on top of the coffee. Even though this is an iced coffee, which I would typically have with a straw, we're going to just sip this straight so that you do get some of that freshly whipped cream on top. And this is a refreshing take on an Irish coffee to have on a summery day. Okay, you got the cream on top, nice yeah. and refreshing. That'll do the trick. Yeah, Look at that. that is my kind of cocktail. <laughs> oh, my uh, word. That's, that, that should be illegal. Right? <laughs> That should well, be illegal. You Nick, you drink that right now, you'll stay up all night. Uh, yeah. True, wow. yeah. It might be a better it might be a better ploy to be honest. Uh Mark, you how how are you doing? Are you are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> I hope I'm coming across as okay. Yeah, are you surviving? Right. Yeah. I am. Yeah. You know, it's it's a waiting game with the restaurants here. Um, just like many parts in the country, but in New York City especially, we're actually fortunate to be doing relatively well. Um in, in the face of COVID, but we're being very cautious because things are very tough around the rest of the country. So they have not reopened indoor dining. I don't know when that's going to happen. The outdoor dining has actually been pretty successful, but the biggest question is as we head into the colder months, what's going to be the approach? What, what are we going to do? So we're really taking it day by day. Um, the industry has been very, very supportive in creating opportunities like this. Um, I'm even entering a cocktail competition where if I got to the finals, it would be kind of like a virtual finals like this. So all sorts of fun opportunities, trying to stay sharp. This, this has been huge. This is kind of the anchor for me every week. Can no we watch one, no. this? How can we support you? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not there yet. I still have to do the entry, but I'll let you know. If it gets to that point, we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. Well, if there's, a, if there's a mixologist in the United States of America that can knock up cocktails on camera like you, then we're yet to see him or her. So no, um I, I just take my take my words and you know, well, do what's appropriate with them. Ignore them, probably. But anyway, <laughs> oh, uh, I appreciate support, them. I appreciate them. You support COVID nineteen relief efforts across horse racing and hospitality. Breederscup dot com forward slash donate. We've been donating. You've been donating through the seventeen editions of this show. Um, apparently, there are only three left. You know, I'd, I'd carry on, but what, you're not going to tell go. everybody that there's ten more after our twentieth show. I mean, we have to no, do- No, I think you'd kill me. No, I wouldn't. I love it. I absolutely love it. I have 1% left on my computer here, so I will leave you all with the fact that I look forward to these shows each and every week and um, learning something. I mean, Mark, I learned so much today, and I know that our viewers feel the same way. And oh, Javier Castellano, you. class act. It was great hearing from mm. Simon and hearing his background. So I love it. I'd happily do it for- 10 more we have to do it around the breeders cup i mean there's just yeah definitely uh, Brittany, I'm, I'm on board for as long as it'll last so perfect. before before the three of us are submerged in a in an overload of sincerity i feel we should uh <laughs> i feel we should end this broadcast right now um <laughs> guys thank you so much love you both and uh, we will see you next week take perfect. care Hi, Brittany.